you very much. Um, so the purpose of this last lecture is um, of two types. The first one will be to finish a rigorous proof of the theorem 2 here, um, at least the point 2 of theorem 2, that I will comment on in a minute. And after that, we will go into eigenvectors dynamics and see what we can do for eigenvectors. And I will just very briefly give motivations about the study of eigenvectors of my uh, random matrices by the end. Okay. So what you can see here on the board is a, a couple of theorems. The first one telling you that there is some invariance of statistics up to some time. And the second one telling you that um, after a shorter time, you have already the GOE statistics. Okay, so this is GOE of size n. And uh, in particular, in the bulk, what we have um, give heuristics for yeah, um, on, on Tuesday is um, that for, for time up to n to the minus one half minus epsilon, so almost up to n to the minus one half, uh, the statistics after running your dyson raya motion have not changed. Okay, at time t and time zero, it's basically the same, up to a small error. My, uh, my capital F here is just a nice function. Uh, and for the edge, you, you can go actually much further. Here I put n to the 1 over 100, but just for sake of concreteness, but you can go even a bit beyond 1. Um, in for concerning theorem 2, uh, which is much more challenging to prove, uh, you have already a relaxation of your dynamics after a shorter time. So just time 1 over n in the bulk and n to the minus 1 third at the edge. So I forgot to mention the dynamics I consider, of course, are the matrix that is in Brown motion, okay, uh, which induces some spectral dynamics. Theorem 1 only relies on the matrix point of view, the fact that the matrix satisfies this equation. But theorem 2 requires the spectral dynamics to be proved. Okay, at least the first line, which is Dyson Brown motion. So let me comment a little bit about um, the spectrum dynamics. I wrote the eigenvector evolution here. The eigenvector associated to lambda k is denoted by uk, and this is something we proved as an exercise yesterday. So everyone here knows how to prove this, right? Um, so in particular, um, what you see is that eigenvectors are very unstable in directions related to eigenvalues that are very close. This is reminiscent of the fact that if these two eigenvalues coincide, you cannot even distinguish eigenvectors. Okay? So when you have, for example, your basis of, um, on, on uh, say, SO3, so this is eigenvector related to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. If lambda 1 and lambda 2 are very close, then instantaneously I'm going to rotate very, very fast in the corresponding plane. Okay? And I'm going to rotate in a very at a very slow pace if I'm in, in a plane related to distant eigenvalues. Um, so it will be important for us, uh, and that will be the, the core of the class today, to understand uh, the mixing time for these dynamics. And it's a very high dimensional one. It's dimension n square, while this one is dimension n, so it will be harder in some sense to understand this one. Um, now, what I promise you um, on Tuesday is to give a proof of theorem 2. Um, and uh, here are some heuristics. So remember that it's a coupling argument, but I will just make it one step more rigorous today than it was on Tuesday. So uh, the coupling argument is, uh, on the one hand, you have your uh, dynamics for lambda k, but you also choose y0, y at time 0, which is goe. And the same dynamics for, and uh, the initial condition um, different from, from uh, uh, your, your, your lambda. And the dynamics for y are just the same. So you do your dyk is equal to 1 over um, dbkk okay and then by looking at the difference between y and x 
you get a parabolic equation. So delta k um, t equal exponential t over 2 um, y k minus x k t satisfies the parabolic equation. which behaves qualitatively speaking something like um, partial derivative in time of your um, delta kt is not too far from one, to one over n um, delta k minus one t plus delta k plus one minus two delta kt divided by um, uh, gamma k minus gamma k minus 1, say, square. So here I only keep the nearest neighbor interaction <coughs> after my uh, subtraction and the parabolic equation I obtain. And it's, it's not too far from discrete Laplacian, divide, uh, speed up by this, this length. Okay. Um, in particular, if you inject what is the difference between two typical locations uh, at the edge or in the bulk, you will find out that you get exactly what you expect, n to the minus two, one third speed at the edge and one over n in the bulk. Okay, so that was the very first step of heuristics. Uh, I will now do a coupling in a slightly different manner, but it's morally speaking the same thing. Now define sk nu at time zero. Um, it's new at time zero to be new yk plus one minus new xk. So I do just a linear interpolation in my initial condition. That's nothing more. Okay. Remember, my, my all my eigenvalues are ordered, and. Um, you, you run the dyson brown motion dynamics with this initial condition. And then we will derive a new to interpolate between both, both cases. Okay. So uh, now you, you do your dxk mu t equal dp tilde kk. So if I can prove that the derivative in u at time t of this object is very small, then it will imply by integrating over nu that my value of xk and yk are very close. Okay? Because of course remark that uh, xk nu 1 is just equal to yk, um, sk 1 t just sk t, yk t. And uh, xk uh, zero t is my lambda k. Okay. Just because for my initial condition will match with y or x at the extremities of my my parameter new, and then it's just the same dynamics as I wrote here for x and for y and lambda. Now, uh, and the interpolation is at time zero, but the equation itself. So the interpolation is just at time zero, yes. and it's not true that at time t, x k is a linear interpolation between y and lambda. It's just not true. Okay. okay. But still, I will pr I will prove that it's a, it's a small number. Now you can just derive this equation in new. Okay, so you need to be careful when, when, when differentiating a, a differential equation in this parameter, but you can just do it. T take a small increment to convince yourself you can do it. Okay. Um, so in particular, if, if I define um, this is bad notation, let's say um, ak nu over time t to be the Differentiate in u of my xk nu t. 
and I multiply by a factor exponential t over 2, it will be to get rid of the Erstein and Beck. So you just define this. Then by differentiating on both sides here, you get the, the usual parabolic equation for this, uh, for this guy. Um. So the reason I, um, I prefer this interpolation to um, the, um, the one I, I was doing here by taking di directly the difference is that what I, when I was taking the difference for delta k on the denominator, I had xk minus uh, lambda k minus lambda l times yk minus yl, if you remember from Tuesday. And this is somehow, um, from, for algebraic reasons, it will behave better. Okay. Um, so, so you have this equation. Okay, so now there is nothing new so far compared to what I was saying on Tuesday. If you prove that it has been smoothing a lot, it means that AK and AK plus 1 for any new will be, will be very close. And as a consequence, by integrating over new, it means that XK and YK are very close. And the gap between XK and the gap between YK are very close. Okay. So, um, so we want to... So for edge universality, say, namely to prove theorem 2, part 2, uh, what we need is the following fact is that uniformly in new between 0 and 1, your ak for t uh, of order much, much greater than n to the minus 1 third, your ak nu t is actually smaller than its typical size. If it's a small o of n to the minus 2 third, then we, al we readily have universality. So in the bulk, I was talking about the gap, so I need to compare AK and AK plus 1. But at the edge, it's not about a gap. Your Tracy Widom statistics is just about distribution of the relative position. Yeah, right? So if you, if you can prove this one, so this is, this is what we aim at doing, right? And if you can prove this, um, just integrate in U now. You integrate between 0 and 1 the new. This estimate. What you obtain is that the difference between xk and yk, between xk and lambda k, sorry, is going to be a small o of n to the minus 2 third. Sk, um, so no, that's my y. So lambda k t is equal to y k t plus a small o of n to the minus 2 third. But this would be enough for Tracy Okay, So we, we want to prove this equation. So mean the individual eigenvalues have nothing? So the individual eigenvalues, after some time, um, um, they, they, they are on the scale of the natural fluctuations, they are just stick together. Okay, the, 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 the gap is smaller than the, the typical scale of distribution. So it's, it's enough for universality. If you plug this estimate in your head here. Is it like for y n t lambda n t or for k plus two n um, plus one? Oh, that's n, yeah. What I meant by k is n here. Thank you. Actually, it's, it's true for any edge eigenvalue, uh, the first 10 eigenvalues, for example, things like this. Um, so, so we want to understand 
this. And um, the reason I focus on the edge here is because there is a particularly simple, simple proof here. Uh, it was in particular, particularly, I mean, very difficult to make these types of heuristics uh, correct because your lambda case may uh, collide. There are some shocks, actually, even though they will never exactly collide, they may get very close together, and it happens. Um, and, and to deal with these shocks, actually, the key um, is to introduce uh, the, the following observable. Um, you define ft, let's say ft of z to be, um, so I need an exponential t over two, minus t over two. So uh, from, from now, I just omit new in my notation. Because everything I'm going to say is uniform in new anyways. Okay, And I want to prove that for one fixed new, this is small. So you, you define this object. It's a strange object. So this, this one is, a diff is a deriv uh, the derivative in new of your xkt. We divide by xkt minus z. So this can be seen as a, as a derivative of the characteristic polynomial in the parameter mu. But we will not really use this fact. Okay. Just, um, so what's the idea? Um, it's very hard to control a k, but maybe some average of the a k's is going to be easier to control. So when you take average of a k, you take a sum of weights times the a k's. And uh, the point is that the, the weights I'm going to use here is the imaginary part of 1 over xk minus z, because we know it's a probability measure, typically. It's um, the imaginary part. is a convolution of the spectral, empirical spectral measure on some scale. Okay. So we, we, we just introduced this, this guy. And this is the sum of all, all k. And um, now it, it's an exercise to prove that this f uh, satisfies a, a stochastic advection equation. And, and then it's just, it just a one-line argument to conclude about universal. So, On this one, you, you have to trust me. Um, but it's really just um, a calculation. So le let me explain you a bit the idea here. If I take some avera any average of the AKs, and I try to understand the evolution of this average with time, um, in my evolution of the AKs, there are, there are shocks. I have this singularity. Okay. So it's very hard to control any type of equations that will emerge from, from an average. On the other hand, if in my average, I put the evolution of xk itself, then a miraculous cancellation will occur, which gives an equation with no shocks. So this equation has no shocks. singularity. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how should we understand this equation? We should understand that the second line is just error term, and the first one is the dominant term. So st is a steel jet transform. S st always stands for the steel jet transform. Thanks. So st here, 
that's my sum of 1 over xk t minus z uh, with a 1 over n. Okay, that's my still just transform. And um, what we will see is that all of this is just error term. And ST is a still just transform of a somehow a, a Wigner matrix. So we expect that it's very close to the limiting Stilges transform of by the local law. So ST is supposed to be about M of Z, but M of Z is not, is, remember, your M of Z is minus Z over two plus square root of Z square minus four. That's the Stilges transform of the semicircle. So we expect ST of Z to be about this. So that's an equation. You add, you add z over 2, and you only get the square root of z squared minus 4. And this is error term. So let's understand why this is error term. So this is error term for z in the mesoscopic scale. So all, everything here is in the mesoscopic scale. So my eta is of scale greater than the typical gap between eigenvalues below. Okay. So in particular. Think about this. A, here I have, uh, this is an object of order one because it's just a Stiglitz transform. It's just a finite formula. This is a, de a first order derivative. Here I take a second order derivative. So it's a, bigger, it's a bigger size typically. However, I have an extra one over n. So if I am on a scale n to the minus one plus epsilon, it would be a smaller size. Okay, and this you can also control and prove it's a smaller order. So um, this equation, let's call it one. One is well approximated, and this one is easy to justify. So it's well approximated by um, DFT is just one half of the square root of z square minus four dz of ft. Okay. Everyone follows um, at least the chain of, of equalities here. Okay. So wh wh what type of equation is this? It's an advection equation, uh, meaning that think about, think about what, what happens. You, you start with at some z, and the derivative in time of the value here is equal to square root of z squared minus 4. But this is typically, if you are in the bulk, for example, between minus 2 and 2, this is basically purely imaginary, because there is, it's at, at, at first order. So it means that it's something like i times a constant dz. If you have i times a constant dz, it's, it's exactly uh, the most standard type of stochastic advection equation. It means that the value at time t here is equal to the value at time 0 much higher. Okay. So I will, I will go into more details after. So it really tells you, because I, you have the good sign here, it's a plus, it, it tells you that it's regularizing. This ft um, at time t for, for very small scales is going to be given by f0 at, la at larger scales. So, but it happens that this equation can be just solved exactly because the characteristics, so this type of advection equation is solved by the method of characteristics. But for this factor here, there is an explicit uh, formula for the characteristics. Uh, so, the derivative in time of ft is equal to, to this. Thank you. Um, so this is an ad advection equation. With solutions of one. 
ft um, at z is equal to f0 at a deterministic point zt, where zt is the following. Um, where's my zt? It's a bit formula, but not so bad. And um, so this you can just check. Okay, derive. Um, it's of course it's not for any function here that you would be able to find the characteristics, but here you have a formula. Um, so what does it look like? What, what do the characteristics look like? So as I told you in the in the book, if you if you start at z zero somewhere here, this is minus two two. If you start here, what you will find out is, is that the characteristics stay, take you almost straight up. Okay. And uh, so this is, sorry, this is z0. Um, but when you, when you add the edge, it's a bit different. You will, you will go on a transversal way. You will actually, at first order, it will be like a parabola like this. So z0 is just uh, my initial point here on any the mesoscopic scale you prefer, and you have zt. So in particular, what it means is that the average of the uk's, uh, of the ak's that I introduced in this observable, um, after so a long time, it's just like taking the average on a bigger scale before. Okay, So it's, a, it's an automatic smoothing effect. It's just that this is a good observable that makes it completely transparent. So um, so now let, let's understand uh, in particular what happens at the edge to prove generosity in terms of scales. So if z0, let me take uh, z0 to be just one point on the mesoscopic scale at the edge, which is just 2 plus i times n to the minus 2 third. Okay, remember that my gap between two uh, eigenvalues at the edge is n to the minus two third. So I, I just consider z scale. Actually, I need to be in a mesoscopic scale for my theorem to apply. So let's let's add some epsilon. It's fine. And uh, I here I can apply any types of local laws, and and my approximation of the, by the deterministic advection equation is correct. Um, and now what you will find out is that zt is is the following type. Then zt, if you just Taylor expand this, it is at first order. Um, so it's going to be 2 plus uh, t square plus, so that's my zt minus z0. Sorry. Plus i n to the minus 1 third. At, at second order in T, say. That's an expansion from here. So what it means is really that you have this parabolic shape at the edge. Uh, yes, because I removed the zero, thank you. Fortunately, you're around. <laughs> um, so what it means is that after time T, what I observe here, it's going to be like what I observe when I'm actually quite far away from the spectrum itself. But when I'm far away here, the average of what I see just below is, is basically zero, or it's very small. So it means that my uh, AT, so the quantity I, I was interested in from the start here, becomes a very small natural basis equation. So this implies, this implies that for T, much greater than n to the minus one third. If 
you're much greater than n to the minus one third, then this term is going to win over this one. So it means that you are really far away from the spectrum. You don't see, you don't even see it anymore in the average I, I, I consider. And as a consequence, what you uh, end up with is the fact that uh, um, f t of z zero is equal to f zero of z t. This we already know at first order, but we now know thanks to this that this is um, actually you can just check it's a small o of n to the minus two three. So many calculations have to be checked here. I'm sorry about it. I don't have to, time to, to put full details about them. Uh, but I just want you to remember that uh, if you consider this type of observable, then all, all types of shocks you may be annoyed by, ju they just disappear. And you have an automatical smoothing effect, which gives you some type of holder regularization for, for, uh, for, for the things you are interested in. OK? Uh, any questions about about this? No? All right. So the cancellation between the shocks is just because you compare the equation for EK and for XK? Yeah, so, so apply it to, the, to your FT of Z. Okay. Just apply it to, of course, you're going to have, you have to, to look at the, f the usual derivative in time of AK because AK is smooth in time. Okay, a k has no d, uh, no no Martingale term. So, so the evolution of this guy makes some shocks appear, but on the other hand, because of this x k here that you derive, you will have other shocks, and they happen to just cancel each other. Okay, it's um. Okay, is, is, uh, is the proof clear? So I, I mentioned it at the edge because it's simpler at the edge than in the bulk. You just have this characteristic go taking you away, so it becomes small, and that's it. Um, and also, I believe that uh, for the purpose of Tracy Widom, proving Tracy Widom in a model you like, no matter which model you like, uh, introducing this just makes it a, a very, very transparent. Okay. All right, so if you don't have uh, more questions, we will go to eigenvectors. So what do we want to prove for eigenvectors? You have, a, uh, let's say, H So yeah, H of Wigner matrix. And um, remember that my notation for eigenvectors, they are here. It is the U case. Um, and for any sequence Q, Qn, so Qn is in Rn, and it's normalized, and it's a, it's a deterministic sequence of unit vectors. Okay. Um, you have Uk, um, projected on Qn. So this Uk depends on n implicitly. And you multiply by square root n. This converges to a standard Gaussian. So this is a, the first part of the statement. 
So what do you expect for your eigenvectors? That they are uniform on the sphere somehow, right? Because this is the case for GOE. For GOE, it's completely transparent. It's because the model itself was designed so that you have invariance by orthogonal conjugacy. Uh, here, it's uh, something you, you probably expect. Um, and you can choose your favorite direction. Of course, you have a representation of the uniform measure on the, on the sphere as a sequence of, <coughs> of independent Gaussians that are normalized. So then this, this theorem for the sphere, uniform measure on the sphere would be obvious. Um, so we, we want to understand this here. So that's the first thing. And the second one is the, the fact that the eigenvectors are flat. And this is something that we, we may call the probabilistic version of, Q of quantum unique ergodicity. Means that for any i, so you you pick your favorite interval deterministic in one n, and you look at the mass, the L two mass given by your eigenvector on i. So you look at the sum of u k of alpha square on i, for the all coordinates in i. And you wonder how much does it deviate from what I expect. If it was completely flat, all of this UK alpha square would be of order 1 over n, okay, because each coordinate has size 1 over square root n. So you, you want to compare it with what it is when you remove, when you recenter. Okay? And you consider the probability that this object is large or small or things like this. Um, and depending on i, so you want to, to prove that the probability that it's large goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So this is for any, for any positive epsilon. But if i is a macroscopic proportion of the coordinates, then this is a good, some good scale, <coughs> because it's, it's an object of order 1, typically. And you compare, we want to prove that it's, it's a small probability to be greater than any constant. But you may choose i, which is um, just a small fraction of the coordinates. It also works. You just need to multiply by a factor n over cardinality of i. Okay, so you are interested in the pr probability that this quantity is large. Now, if i is just one coordinate, this is um, a random variable divided by n. I multiply by n, so it's just a random variable altogether. Alt so there is no chance it's true. So I need to, to add just 1 over the cardinality of i. But now, now it's correct. So um, I will not come back to, to uh, I will not mention the, the origins of, of this name. Um, it was uh, introduced by Ronick and Sarnak in the context of manifolds, some context very close to the Boyi-Gazian and Schmidt conjecture I mentioned. For generic manifolds, you expect that in the semi-classical limits, the eigenstates occupy space very well in terms of their L2 norm. Um, this is a modest probabilistic analog here. Okay. Now, how do you prove these types of things uh, based on the dynamics? So theorem one, it's just going to work exactly the same way, proving that you have invariance of your eigenvectors up to some time, <coughs> thanks to the local law as an input, which is a fundamental object here. You, you can just prove theorem one in the same way. Remember that for theorem 1, we were just using the fact that the entries of the green function were bounded. Okay. So we were not using dynamics at all for theorem 1. But for we want to understand theorem 2, the analog of theorem 2, exactly for, for eigenvectors now. Yes. This is true for all k. So you, you choose a deterministic, so, so things are a bit non-precise here, thank you. So your i is a deterministic subset of 1n, which may vary with n, but it's a deterministic one. And k, same thing. It's a sequence of numbers, all of them be between 1 and n, but a deterministic one. And then it's correct. 
the probability is that this is true for one, one k or for all of them together? This one? Yes. This one is for one k. Um, it's a challenge to prove it for, for more, for all together, and it's a challenge to have the absolute optimal error term here. As I will mention by the end of, of the lecture, this is an important thing, actually. But if you don't prove it for all cases, you cannot really call it quantum unique aggressivity. <coughs> unique aggressivity means that all eigenfunctions are flat. Um, it, it, mean, it means that you... you um, okay, yeah. Um, so let's let's call it quantum unique uh, quantum ergodicity if you want, but quantum ergodicity, on the other hand, is not that either because it's a bigger average. But um, I'm, that's perfectly fine. The first part, you take uh, k a deterministic sequence, also. Yes, yes. Um, so what you have is. Um, so theorem one is still true for the observable, which is, for example, uh, this um, a function of this, or a function of square root n q u k. Okay, so um, with the same scales, it's going to be correct. So, so we don't really care about theorem one here. Uh, for theorem two, we want to analyze uh, these dynamics and understand the mix. Um, so you see, as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, um, what is complicated is that some directions are going to move very, very fast, some others will not move fast. How does it all together combine to get uniform on the, on the orthogonal group? That's, that's the question. Um, so I, I would love to have a proof based on um, arguments a la Bacri emery or things like this, just identifying this as a diffusion with a very good convexity <coughs> type of constant, but we, we don't have such a proof. And um, what you can do is to introduce, uh, again, a set of observables which behave pretty well uh, under these dynamics. Um, so theorem two, um, is just going to be true um, on the same scales. So is still true for the same f. Uh, and uh, here is a sketch of proof. So for eigenvalues, we were proceeding by coupling. And uh, here, I have no idea how to couple. Um, this is dimension n square. Uh, things don't, I, I could not find any way to make it parabolic. Uh, and on the other hand, what we want to prove convergence to is much simpler. It's just a Gaussian. So maybe just by taking moments, we can prove that they converge to the moments of a Gaussian. Let, let's look at the very first moment. Let's try to understand why it goes to zero, and then the second one, and let, let's try to understand the heuristics here. Okay, first moment. So first, I, I, just to make my life easier, I will not take any Qn. I will just take the first coordinate of, of, uh, of the canonical basis, OK? So uh, take Qn square 1. Let's prove it in that case. It will be convincing enough, OK? So um, what do we get here? I just project on E1. This is projected on E1. 
this is projected on E1. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an equation involving all projections of my eigenvectors on E1. And if I take expectations, this term goes away. So I just end up with um, an exponential decay to 0. So the d over dt of the expectation of my ukt. And I condition on my path lambda from 0 to infinity. I will comment a little bit more on about this. What you obtain is that this is minus 1 over n, minus 1 over 2n, sum of 1 over lambda k minus lambda l square, l equal 1 to n, uh, l different from k, sorry. Uh, multiplied by the same thing. So the reason I can do this conditioning and take my lambda case out is because these b's here, and that's a very important fact, are completely independent. The noise driving the evolution of eigenvalues is independent of the noise driving the ones of, of uh, eigenvectors. So you can see these coupled dynamics, and that's a key point here. It's actually a very nice fact for these dynamics. Imagine you are first given the eigenvalue path, and on the top of it, Conditionally on this eigenvalue path, you, you, you run the eigenvector dynamics. Uh, these dynamics uh, that we proved yesterday <coughs> were first proved in the context of covariance matrices by Marie-France Bru in the 80s. And it's even simpler to prove it uh, for the Hermitian case. Okay. Um, I think they require even more attention. They are, they are really interesting objects. So now, what is the size of this, of this here? Well, um, if you are in the bulk, you know that lambda k minus lambda l is like k minus l over n. So this will be of order n. And this will be n to the one third on the edge. So this is like n in the bulk. And n to the one third at the edge. Okay, so obviously here it's extremely simple to prove that the expectation goes to what you want on the good time scales. Okay, and at an exponential rate, it's very very fast, um, very very strong convergence. Okay. But this is a bit too easy. Let's look at the second moment. And let's give it a name. Um, let's call it G, um, GT of K, the expectation of my UK of 1 square, and conditionally on my path. Um, now it's, it's a Nito formula on the square, and you will find out that you get the exact same parabolic equation as, as the one we are used to. Okay, so again, exercise. So the UK of 1, after projecting on E1, this equation of dimension n squared becomes uh, uh, the equation of dimension n. You take the square, you apply it to the square, take expectation to, to make the Martingale terms go away, and this is what you obtain. Okay. Um, but for this equation, we we just know that it regularizes on these time scales too. We just this is basically everything I told you about eigenvalues. Okay, That's, it's, it is a very same equation. So 
regularization on the same scale. Um, so we know the first and second moment converges to the Gaussian ones, but this is not very surprising because uh, if you believe in some symmetry between the UKs, of course all, all expectations become the same for UK square in the limit because it's normalized in L2. What's more difficult to understand is the higher moments. If you take UK 1 to the 4, for example, then it will not be true that the equation becomes autonomous in these observables. The UK 1 to the 4 will, always, will also include some mixed terms like UK uh, 1 to the square times UL 1 to the square. So you need to enlarge your space here to, to get uh, the, the good point of view. So to, uh, to enlarge your, your state space. So um, the good way to do this is as follows. So it's really, um, it's really a random walk in a random environment um, perspective here. It's, uh, the random environment is given by your eigenvalues trajectory, which is random, and on the top of it you run a random walk. So for general, moment, here is, here is how it goes. Um, I, I need to first talk about something completely different. You look at configurations on the set of endpoints. So uh, you start at 1, 2, 3, up to n. And you look at some configuration, that let's call it eta, in the particle uh, system's point of view, that's a traditional way. So let's say, for example, they have um, three particles, one at I, two at I, and two and one at side J. Okay, and this is one configuration eta of my three particles. I can I can decide. So these are in non indistinguishable, and I just decide about the configuration how to put these three somewhere in between one and two n, one and n. So this is my eta. And here I have three particles. So this number of particles, let, let's call it P. Um, and to, the, to this eta, I associate an observable, dt of eta, which will be sub the expectation of a mixed moment depending on the position, uh, normalized by the corresponding Gaussian moments. So you take gt of eta to be the expectation of the product of uk right over all k, uk1 to the power 2 eta i, 2 eta k. And this is an expectation conditionally on the trajectory, again, where my eta k denotes the number of particles of eta at side k. And I normalize by what I expect it to be in the limit. I expect these guys to be independent Gaussians, right? Each coordinate converges to an independent Gaussian. So I just normalize by the corresponding thing for Gaussians. Um, so let's, let's normalize with the square root n. These are independent standard Gaussians. This n case. Okay. And now the the good uh, algebraic uh, fact is that the GT of eta satisfies the parabolic equation. Just as the space is not just one particle, is not just k, is not uh, is a function of k. It's just that these particles will move. Then it's a fact. And please make sure you're, you know your ito for proving it. The fact is that um, the derivative in time of ft at site eta 
of a GT, sorry, GT outside theta. This is basically the sum of my GT at the side eta ij, where I, eta ij means I, I take a particle at side i and I bring it to j. Minus, but I will, I will gt of eta, divided by um, lambda k, uh, lambda i minus lambda j. And I have a factor here, which is twice the number of particles at i, times 1 plus twice the particle at j. That's the sum over all i is minus lambda j. OK, is this readable? So eta ij, so remember eta k is a number of, eta subscript k is a number of particles at k. Eta sub, sub, uh, superscript ij is a configuration obtained after taking a particle at i, bringing it to j. Um, of course, you cannot bring a particle from i to j if there is no particle at i. But this is fine because I have a factor 2 eta i here. OK? Um, so anyways, it's an equation. And again, these guys are positive. So it's a parabolic type. So all of them will become equal. So in the, in the large n uh, limit and large time limit, all of these observables become equal, which means that the, the moments converge, converge to the Gaussian ones. Once you know they are equal, it's easy to justify that they are equal to 1, actually, okay, by, by just a normalization. And if they are equal to 1, because of the ratio is with the Gaussians, you, you just have what, whatever you, you expected. OK? Um, I think the message here about the two examples I gave you for one good observable for edge universality and one good one for bulk universality is for, for proving that you have these um, statistics, Gouda or, 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 or Tracy Widom or Gaussian QUE and so on, um, you, you cannot rely on any inter explicit integrability, obviously, but you can rely on somehow integrability of the dynamics. You, you, you exhibit observables that satisfy nice dynamics. Um, okay, so other questions about, about this? Um, I just gave the, the main ideas. Of course, technically, from there, proving that it becomes equal, it's, it's a technical idea. But it this can is be. true for any fixed eta. So the equation is true for any fixed eta. So you really need to think about this as uh, your, your three particles are going to move. They, they will jump. Okay, And uh, they will jump to, um, to converge to the equilibrium measure through these dynamics. And the rates depends on the inverse of the distance square between the eigenvalues. So a, a particle will be very likely to jump to its nearest neighbor and not very likely to go far on one just by one jump. And when you say the jump, you mean that GT, you, inter you interpret GT as a, as a density of particles? Uh, no, d d what I mean by the jump is that this is a generator of um, of, uh, of a process on the on the space of all particles eta, and this process corresponds to jumps. Okay. Sorry, my question. I mean, it means that GT is a is a sort of a, a density density function, and you look at the density or the probability of being at the at the configuration eta. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Um, So the, the GTs will all will all become um, become flat. I mean, you, yes, you can you can you can consider it as, as just what you said. But if you start with a Dirac, for example, it will just completely spread out. Um, this kind of the analysis of this equation can be done um, only if you know the equilibrium measure pretty well, because you need tools like Dirichlet forms and so on. You need to know the equilibrium measure to to talk about the Dirichlet form, use reversibility, things like this. Um, 
So you need to have an explicit equilibrium measure for this. It happens that if you consider the GOE, the GUE dynamics, the equilibrium measure on the space of configuration theta is just the uniform measure. Any eta is as likely as the other. It's not obvious from the equation, but it's true. But if you consider GOE, which it's a slightly different, I mean, this is GOE, GUE is a bit simpler, and you get equilibrium. But if you consider GOE, it's a more complicated equilibrium measure, but still explicit. So once again, it's a weird fact that GUE is simpler than GOE from a calculation perspective. But um, I, I don't have much time to just write what the equilibrium measure is, but it's, uh, it's not a complicated one, for even for GOE. So when you say equilibrium measure, is it given by GT of eta when T goes to infinity? Or? Uh, no, no, no. Um, no. Um, let me make it a bit more explicit. So imagine you, you, you start with a, with a configuration eta at time zero. Eta at time zero. And uh, then you put, a, you put a clock on each particle of eta, which will ring at a rate. And this clock will, will ring, for, for, the, for, for example, for this link. You, you put a clock on each link between one particle and empty sites and the clock will ring at this rate. Okay. And when the clock rings, the particle jumps. Okay. So that's what, that's what happens. So your eta zero, it's, it's n eta itself will not converge to something, but the probability distribution of eta will converge to the equilibrium measure. Okay. So, so if it's clear, maybe let's, let's go to motivations for eigenvectors study. Okay. The, is this clear? So here, what you need to do is to you know, bound the spectral gap uniformly in the lambdas? Or um, so you cannot really do that. There, there is no, you know, the problem is, uh, again, that uh, some directions are good, some are bad. Uh, some, when lambda keys are close, then mix very fast, but when it is far and further, it doesn't really mix. Um, so what, you, what we are using, technically speaking here, is the maximum principle. Um, you take the maximum over all configurations, so you pick the configuration in eta such that zt of eta is maximum, and we prove that the derivative in time set goes at least at some rate by a maximum principle, and for this, as an input, we need the local law from the very first class. And so, so it's a Gromval argument, and it proves that gt of eta goes very fast to one. Um, so it's a, it's a more classical PD argument here. <coughs> Any other question? Okay. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the problem of um, going uh, non-mean fields. Okay. And it will be related uh, to, to your question about how strong is our quantum ergodicity? Is, is it unique or not? And things like this. So. Um, Let's consider band matrices. But before going into that, I, I just want to mention this is far from a closed subject. In particular, what we prove here is that some observables, which are these projections on the eigenvectors, converge to equilibrium very fast. We don't know that the measure itself is close to R, in like in total variation. Okay? The total measure of the group being close to R in total variation, we just don't know it. It's, it's way too strong. As a, if you find an argument for this, it would be very interesting. Okay, so it's a, it's a way to make linked with what was last week, mix, general mixing type arguments and so on. But here we are in dimension divergent. So, um, so for bond matrices, so so it's good. I still have these statements here. Now uh, here is a. Um, classical problem, which is also related to the so-called Anderson transition that was probably mentioned by Simone last week. You now consider, in, don't, don't consider a Wigner matrix, but you consider a matrix with uh, entries being only close to the diagonal. So in other words, you 
you take some bandwidth here, which will be of order, actually for, for convenience, I will call it 4w minus 1. Um, and where my matrix is still of time size n by n. And you wonder about what are the spectral properties of this matrix where my hijs are independent, have finite moments of all orders. And, um, but, but now if W is very small co compared to N, it's basically a, a sparse matrix, not only a sparse matrix, but a sparse matrix where you impose the, the geometry. Um, so you have the expectation of hij square here is one over let, let's take it 1 over 4w minus 1. This way, the sum of variances is constant on each line. So we have the semicircle distribution is the limit in the same scale we can prove. Okay. So you, you still have a semicircle distribution between minus 2 and 2. Moments are finite of all orders. And you wonder what happens about eigenvectors, for example, or eigenvalues statistics for this matrix. So the extreme cases we know are when it's w of size uh, complete size so that it's a full matrix, you end up with um, obviously the GOE and, uh, and uh, the delocalization of eigenvectors. This is what we just proved for Wigner matrices. But if the matrix is completely diagonal, um, then of course if the eigenvectors are completely localized. And uh, the statistics typically, if, if, your, if your distribution is smooth for the entries, the statistics would be Poisson. Okay, so is there a phase transition? So it, it, it's really a question of, of transition here. Okay. So the conjecture by Fyodorov and Mirlin, and uh, it was, uh, there, there were numerics in the 80s and 90s about it, is that uh, the transition occurs exactly for W of order square root n. is much smaller than square root n. What you have is Poisson plus localization. And for w much greater, you have go down in the bulk, say, plus delocalization. So I must say that at the edge, things are pretty well understood thanks to a work of Sodin. And the reason the edge can be done is that the moment method applies. No matter that the eigenvalue, uh, that the matrix is full or not, you can take the moments. And if you do very smart uh, combinatoric tricks like Sodin did, you can calculate the moments of even for, for the bound matrix. And, and the large moments give you access to the greatest eigenvalue. It just singles it out. Uh, in the bulk, there is no such, such argument. And um, so this is a dimension one bond matrix, but this is um, really not to be, um, it's good to keep in mind that it's not restricted to the analog with a random Schrodinger in dimension one, because you could look at the bond matrix in dimension two. Namely, you take a box in Z2, imagine you make it peri periodic boundary condition and you decide that each vertex is going to interact not only with its nearest neighbor, but with neighbors up to distance w. And this is n. So this, this works in, in any dimension. And um, it's a difficult problem to prove that for this model in dimension two, actually for any W of type n to the epsilon, you are supposed to have the Godin delocalization regime. So there is no transition for, one, uh, for a polynomial n. This transition is supposed to occur for a logarithmic n in dimension two. Um, but let's stick to dimension one. Okay. 
So of course, th this model was introduced um, as supposedly an easier model for the Anderson transition. Um, so wh what is known about this? Um, on the Poisson and uh, localization side, there is a work of Schenker, who proves that W up to n to the 1, 8, um, you have uh, indeed um, delocalization. And on this, um, so Schenker, OK for W of uh, order up to n to the 1, 8. And uh, for on, on the delocalization side, there are, there are basically two approaches. The first approach is by supersymmetry. So this is a, a term you heard in Christoph's talk, uh, you heard about in Christoph's talk already. Supersymmetry and Berezin integrals. So what the, the type of results that I know is that if your um, matrix have as a, as a specific variance profile um, and the entries are Gaussian, then you have a representation of the green function in terms of, of, um, of very high dimensional um, and integrals I don't understand everything about. And uh, you can perform some rigorous asymptotic analysis. And it was proved by Sharbina uh, that if w is greater than a small constant times n, and the entries are Gaussian, then indeed you, you have Godin and delocalization. So this is the work of uh, Sharbina. So Tatiana Sharbina. <coughs> and um, Tatiana and Maria Sharbina have, have proved that actually you, you really have the transition uh, at square root n, but not for the st local statistics, for the characteristic polynomials in some sense, which is, a, for technical reasons, an easier thing to, to handle. So, so for, for the local statistics, it's just not known for any model that there is a transition. Uh, with the supersymmetry method, there, there is also work of uh, Erdos, uh, of Bauer and Erdos, uh, who prove uh, delocalization in some regime. Uh, I think W up to n to the 6 over 7, something like this. But this is always in the sense of um, either Gaussian entries or, or entries that match Gaussian random variables up to false moment, because then you can do some moment matching. Um, and what I want to just mention in the next 15 minutes is how the QUE picture or QE picture and, um, and the dynamics can help also to understand this problem in the delocalization side. Um, and this allows us to do something quite modest, w small greater than just a small constant times n. So the constant could actually be like 1 over double log n if you want, but we are not in the polynomial scales. Um, and, but, th but the entries don't have to be Gaussian, just any entries is fine. OK, so, so it's, a, it's a famous problem. This conjecture was, was given by Fyodorov and Mirlin. And um, what fails here? So remember the, the global approach we have here. So the second point tells you that after some time, you already have relaxation. Actually, theorem 2 may work. Just uh, you start with your Wigner spectrum, with not Wigner, with your band matrix spectrum. You run the dynamics a little bit. Actually, proving that after a little bit of time you, you have uh, GOE is fine. Um, not easy, but fine. But theorem 1 has absolutely no chance to be true. Remember that theorem 1 relied on the fact that the variance was constant along the dynamics. If you start with a matrix where the geometry is imposed, it's completely wrong. So um, for, for the proof, uh, theorem, one fail, uh, theorem 1 fails. So you need to do something different.
Um, so what can you do? Um, so what I just want to explain in the remaining time is uh, the technique of mean field reduction. I think it's interesting to remember uh, just as, as a general technique, if you have a, a model where some geometry is imposed, you can maybe somehow do come back to a mean field problem. Um, so here is one way to think about it. You have your matrix. So let's, let's call this matrix H. Uh, let's call it A, B, B star B and uh, D, where I'm going to take uh, this block of size 2W and uh, this one of size n minus 2W, obviously. Okay. So one way to think about it is that my A is, is this one. And um, actually, it's a, it's a complete one. Okay. So now you, you're going to write down what the eigenvalue equation means by going to short complement in terms of A. So you have your, um, your A B star. B D times um, let's say let's say you write your eigenvector W K and P K and this eigenvector is just a, the block decomposition for U K your typical eigenvector for H and you just assume that this is lambda K times W K so this implies that you have the following fact. Some matrix I'm going to define Q evaluated at lambda k at wk is equal to lambda k. And this Q, QE is A, it's just a short complement. It's A minus B star, D minus E to the minus 1, B. Actually, B star here. Yes. Okay. So if you so you, you define this one for a fixed parameter e, this is your your matrix. Now, when you do the short complement, e becomes random itself. It's lambda k. Okay. So so it's a complicated equation because the dependence in lambda k. You cannot say I have a fixed matrix and I look for the eigenvalues because it, the matrix itself depends on, on the eigenvalue. But let's make a graph of the eigenvalues of QE as a function of E. And then what we are interested in will be the intersection will, with, uh, with uh, the, the x equal y axis. Here is a, some big graph I want to do. Here is a parameter E. And for each fixed E, I want to put the eigenvalues of QE. So I will have two W points for each parameter E. And they will vary in a continuous way, typically, in E. Except when I cross an eigenvalue of D itself, because I have a singularity. So let's single out the, the, the eigenvalues of D here, which will be the singularities. So let's call them mu1, mu2, so, new, um, so it's n minus w, minus 2w. So this here has the eigenvalues of D. And then my, 
my eigenvalues of QE will depend on E, and uh, they, I know that I, I will have some abscissa, vertical abscissa at each mu i. So typically for one given E, I, I will have my two, my two W eigenvalues somewhere here. They will evolve, and this one will, will just drop at the first mu one. This one will drop at the first mu two, at the, se second, at the second mu, and so on. But when this one drops, another one appears here. Okay, it's this kind of graph. So you, so you get a graph of this type, and then some others appear. They may drop again. Anyways, it's, it's a complete mess if you want, it's fine, okay. It is something like this. And, uh, but the eigenvalues you are interested in is, is gonna be the intersection. Because Q at lambda needs to be have eigenvalue lambda. So you are interested in these numbers here. Now, how can you really understand this? So let's, let's make a zooming. So, so the first time we considered these graphs, it was not clear at all um, whether there is some structure, say. Uh, but it's, it's very simple. You, if you zoom in, you take n extremely large and you zoom around some one given axis. And what you will observe after this zooming is that the, the blue lines are basically parallel in the limit. They, they, they never intersect. There, there is a, the fact that they never intersect is qualitatively easy to, to prove. Okay. But, uh, but then it, it really looks like they are parallel. Okay. Not necessarily uh, 45 degrees this way, but just parallel. If is they really are, what it means is that for one given E, say here, for one given E, you consider the eigenvalues of QE. But now QE is a matrix of type some, some, some complicated object plus a mean field. And A is independent of this one. So for fixed E, it's, it's one deterministic matrix plus a mean field. So it's a mean field matrix and the techniques I just mentioned in this class, they apply, there is a lot of work, but they apply. Okay. Um, so here, what it means is that we actually know that for fixed E, the statistics of these gaps are GOE. Okay. But now, if the, line is, uh, if the lines really are parallel, you just make a projection, and it means that this one will also be GOE. Okay, so that's how you want to proceed. So of course, I'm just pushing the problem further here. I want to prove the lines are parallel. Okay. So how do you prove the, pro the lines are parallel? And it's, uh, it's the fact that these slopes are exactly related to quantum unique type ergodicity types of problems. So, and uh, just one formula to write. Um, what is, so let's call, let's call these slopes uh, C1, C2. Maybe for fixed E, you can, you can order your, your eigenvalues and your, these are just some lines, depending on E. And um, one formula is uh, that the derivative in E of your C um, K of E is basically one minus um, one over the sum between one and um, two W of your UK um, that's UK so that's UK UK of alpha square and uh, alpha equal one two. So it's, it's not completely true. You need to put a, a small perturbation but, uh, whose, whose effect is negligible, but this is really related to this object. 
So you look at your original matrix, it has an eigenvector, remember, your H has an eigenvector UK, the big matrix. UK was decomposed in blocks, but you may wonder about what is the mass given by the first two W coordinates. So if this mass happens to be very close to a deterministic constant, then this is independent of K, and the slopes are the same. Okay. So, so imagine you have the strongest form of QUE statement you want. Okay. Then this mass is nothing but 2W over N. It's a, it's, a, it's a constant. And it does not depend on K. And these are just the components of WK? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. So the question is the relative mass of WK compared to PK. Um, so, um, so, so now you, you understand why knowing QUE for the band matrix implies somehow universality. Um, so, but again, I'm just pushing the problem one step further. I want to prove QUE for my band matrix. But this is an easier problem. Because um, imagine that for this mean field type of matrices, you know that the eigenvectors are flat. You, you, you know that QUE is true for each one such matrix. Eigenvectors give, have a well spread out mass. Then you can do some patching, namely, your so you have your band and you what what we just did is to look at this short complement related to this box and we know that uh, the mass of the eigenvector is, is is what you expect say but now you can do it for another box say this one. And you know that the mass of the eigenvector here in this box is going to be what you expect. Okay? But because this, these are, after short complements, these are mean field problems. So you can actually prove QUE. Okay? And you do it for another box. So if, if on each, uh, each of these boxes, the, co the corresponding coordinates of your eigenvectors, so the L2 mass here is going to be well spread out, the, the L2 mass here as well, and so on, then you can just patch. And it means that the whole, the whole vector has the mass you expect in any smaller box. And uh, so I think the, the moral of the story is that uh, the L2 mass of eigenvectors is a more extensive quantity so that you can patch. And after learning something about eigenvectors, you can deduce universality thanks to the fact that the lines are parallel. Okay, so that's the idea. How, how far can you go? So, so far we cannot go very far. Uh, we can go to here, because there are technicalities everywhere. Uh, but let's come back to your question. Uh, if, 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 you knew, if we knew the very strongest form of QUE for these eigenvectors, for example, if the basis was really hard in the sense of, uh, if, if for any such matrix QE, so here's a problem for you. If for any such matrix UE, the eigenbasis was a very, very close to R, okay, uh, say in total variation, um, optimal rates, and so on, then we could push very far here. And, uh, and it actually gives heuristics for the square root n transition. Because lines keep parallel exactly up to, wh when you put all indices together with the optimal QE, up to square root n, you, you can still argue that they the parallelism keeps enough. And in some sense, it also gives you a for the Poisson regime, because these lines oscillate too much after when you go beyond square root n. But this is, this is a very hard, very hard problem. But, uh, but to make progress here, um, it would be wonderful if someone could find a way to use mixing type arguments for the dynamics I consider for eigenvectors. Okay, so that we, we get a stronger, stronger form of, of QUE. Um, all right, so that's the end of this lecture. And uh, I just want uh, you to remember that this dynamic thing, uh, which looks a bit artificial in some sense, uh, for the types of problems we, we consider, um, it happens to be not so difficult. You, have, you had this theorem one and two, which summarize the general ID. But, uh, oh, they're not here anymore. Uh, but the, um, 
but th there is still a lot of room for improvement in the technicalities. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Just want to make sure the dynamic for the band matrices. Do you run also run the dynamic for the zeros or? No, so we never run the dynamics here uh, with this starting point. We first perform a short complement formula. You obtain matrices of this type, and on this one you run the dynamics because on this one you have a chance to keep variance constant. Okay. So that's the idea of mean field reduction. You, you first reduce your problem, and then you run the, the usual things, the usual types of arguments. And, uh, but if you run dynamics here directly, there are two natural choices. If you run it everywhere, then the eigenvector and eigenvalue equation is integrable. We have a, a very nice equation. But the theorem 1 will fail, because variance is not constant. On the other hand, if you only run the dynamics on the places where there is initially randomness, the dynamics are not integrable anymore. It's a very, it becomes a very complicated dynamics involving eigenvalues and eigenvectors together, which I have no idea how to analyze. Another question? A question here on your short complement formula. Does the, the fact that A, B, and D are independent uh, is very important? Or? Yes. It's completely fundamental because I can see this matrix as uh, I have a deterministic one plus something independent I'm adding. It's, um, I mean, maybe you can relax a little bit this hypothesis, but f at the heart of the argument, it is important, yes. But yeah, yeah. So you have to have this uh, deterministic B uh, inverse by, by this. Uh, and you can control what's happening when, when you approach a pole or you approach a. Yeah, so. Uh, we, we are interested in local things, right? We, we are looking at what happens in a box like this, and we, we want to prove universality, so we are interested in what happens around somewhere where there is an intersection. And we can, once the box is centered around an intersection, you can, you, there is an argument which says there, there is no singularity in that very small box. And here you say that you use QE for these uh, partial, partial eigenstates, but you need all of them together, yeah, I guess you yes. need to for, for yes. all the UK. So this is why, um, oh no, no, you, 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 need, you need QE for one UK, but for different boxes. Okay. Uh, one UK, but different boxes. And, um, and you don't need all UKs if you want universality, because you, if you want universality, you just need to know that two lines are parallel. So two UKs will be enough. And um, but yeah, wh what you what you point at uh, the fact that uh, the strongest forms of QUE are are important is absolutely clear here. Yes.